Okay, good. Uh, we should move on. There's still a few uh, questions, which I hope you can answer by typing afterwards. Uh, but then we move on to the next speaker, and that's uh, Sasha van Albada uh, from the Research Center in Jülich. And it's Hello, everyone. And um, type. Yeah, to just, go, to just go ahead. Um, I was going to tell the title, but you can maybe do it yourself. And then hopefully... There you go. Um, yeah, we can see it now. Like this? Oh, it's perfect. Okay, so uh, I will talk about uh, large-scale spiky network models of primate cerebral cortex, um, which try to capture basic properties of cortical anatomy and resting state dynamics. Um, I have come up with this analogy to illustrate why it's important to gain a basic understanding of the brain as a physical system if we ultimately want to understand how it functions. So consider um, a water strider, um, one of these insects that, uh, that walk on water. And if we want to understand how the water strider manages to stay afloat, we need to know about a basic property of water, namely uh, surface tension. Uh, if we don't know about surface tension, uh, we would come up with the wrong explanation for how the water strider manages to do this. We would um, perhaps think that the water strider is particularly light or ascribe Jesus-like tendencies to it. And uh, in other words, we are more likely to come to the right conclusions about the mechanism uh, when we know about water as a physical system. And um, we also need to use the right parameter values. So if we model the system in a slightly soapy uh, regime, say, we would predict that the water strider would sink. Um, and um, in the same way, uh, we need to model the brain in the right parameter regime to obtain reliable predictions about its uh, behavior and function. Um, the main question we're trying to answer is how does the complex neural networks um, connectivity of the cerebral cortex give rise um, to its dynamics on different scales from the microscopic spiking activity to the macroscopic interactions between areas as seen for instance in uh, fMRI functional connectivity. Uh, another aspect of cortical resting state dynamics is that the firing rates of neurons differ across layers, tending to be highest in layer five and lowest in uh, layers two and three. And um, during brain states akin to the resting state, um, activity tends to propagate down cortical hierarchies as illustrated by this EEG study in which um, there was more feedback propagation from parietal to occipital uh, regions during visual imagery, a condition that's more similar to the resting state um, as compared uh, to perception. As a first model system, uh, we chose macaque uh, vision-related cortex because of the richness of the available data sets and because it forms a, a stepping stone to the human brain. Um, Another advantage is that it's organized in a more or less regular manner as exemplified by visual hierarchies. And this allows us to, uh, to make informed guesses about connectivity where the experimental data are lacking. Um, the vision related areas in macaque uh, contain about uh, 800 million neurons uh, per hemisphere and can be parcelated into 32 areas, which are not all purely visual, but, uh, but somehow involved in vision. And this includes uh, occipital areas like primary and secondary visual cortices, temporal and parietal areas involved in motion processing and object recognition, but also prefrontal and parahippocampal areas involved in eye movements, attention, uh, memory encoding and retrieval. Um, but because 800 million neurons are still too many to simulate routinely, we start by representing each area by um, a square millimeter uh, microcircuit with a full density of neurons and synapses, leading to a total of about 4 million neurons connected by a 24 billion synapses. And this network is still uh, very large, so we run it on a supercomputer in Jülich um, using the Nest simulator. 
And we model each area by a microcircuit using leaky integrated and fire neurons uh, divided into eight populations, uh, two in each of these four layers. And to focus on the influence of the connectivity on the dynamics, we give all neurons identical intrinsic um, properties. And, um, and the connectivity is population specific given by connection probabilities, but, but otherwise random. And an external Poisson drive represents the non-modeled parts of the brain. This isolated microcircuit model produces asynchronous irregular uh, spiking activity like shown here. Uh, with layer and population uh, firing rates matching experiments. Um, coming back to the notion of uh, visual hierarchies, depending on uh, their relative hierarchical positions, vision-related areas have different laminar connection patterns. Feed-forward uh, projections uh, originate mainly in the supergranular layers uh, 2 and 3, and they terminate mainly in layer 4. And feedback projections uh, uh, originate mainly in infragranular layers and terminate outside layer four. And one can then define a hierarchy that's as consistent as possible with, with all the pairwise um, connection patterns. However, um, due to deviations from the stereotypical laminar patterns, there's some indeterminacy in the positions of the areas in the hierarchy. And one way of resolving this indeterminacy is to define hierarchies based on the local site architecture of, of areas. So so-called architectural types characterize the, uh, the neuron density and the distinctiveness of the lamination of the cortical areas. Primary visual cortex, uh, V1, is a U-laminate area with distinctive layers, um, high neuron density and a thick layer 4. And uh, going up the hierarchy, the neuron density decreases and layer 4 becomes thinner and eventually uh, disappears altogether in a granular areas. Um, as opposed to uh, neuron density, the volume density of, of synapses remains roughly constant, so that in, um, in higher areas, the neurons receive more synapses per neuron. And these architectural types are, are relevant for us because we need to determine the population sizes and specifically for, for areas for which neur neuron densities were not measured, we can estimate these from the architectural types where, where th those are known. And when we can then multiply the neuron densities with um, total cortical thickness and the relative thicknesses of the layers, which were estimated here from a lot of micrographs from the literature, and to compute uh, the, the population sizes, the numbers of neurons in a given area and layer. For the connectivity between areas, we use axonal tracing data collected in the COCOMAC database and uh, from the lab of Henry Kennedy. Uh, the COCOMAC data are mainly qualitative, telling us which areas connected to which, and um, the Mar uh, Markov and Kennedy <coughs> data are quantitative, sorry, <coughs> measuring the fractions of labeled neurons or FLN in each area sending connections to the area injected with a retrograde tracer. And these data are, are extensive, but they're still incomplete, so that we need statistical regularities to fill in the missing values. And one thing we use is the uh, exponential decay of, uh, of connection density with uh, the distance between the areas. And so, um, according to the currently available uh, data, roughly two-thirds of area pairs are connected, but what's more important is, um, is the connection density it varies uh, widely, uh, spanning about six orders of magnitude. <clears throat> As a sanity check, we, we tested whether areas that perform similar functions cluster uh, together in our model, and this reveals that um, uh, primary and secondary visual cortex form a small cluster, and the areas of the ventral stream, which perform object recognition, cluster together, and the dorsal stream areas, which process uh, moving stimuli, the um, uh, frontal areas and the superior um, temporal polysensory areas and some um, uh, residual mixed clusters, but overall the uh, community structure is, is very reasonable. For the, for the laminar uh, inter-area connection patterns, we use uh, fractions of supergranular labeled neurons or SLN from retrograde tracing studies. So SLN measures the proportion of uh, labeled cells in layers two and three relative to the cells uh, labeled across all layers. 
and then we estimate the missing values with the statistical fit against uh, the log ratio of, of neuron densities of a pair of areas involved. Um, on the target side, uh, we need to map the synaptic locations to the, to the locations of the cell bodies, which may be in a different layer. And for this, we use um, morphological neuron reconstructions and um, assume that the um, probability for, for a synapse to be established on a given type of neuron is proportional to the total length of its dendritic, dendritic tree in the given layer. And then uh, putting everything together, we arrive at uh, an area and layer specific connectivity map. But simply constructing uh, the connectivity directly from the data uh, doesn't yield good activity. Uh, so we use a mean field theory to, to further inform uh, the parameters. Um, however, uh, the resulting ground state still looks very much like our, uh, like our isolated microcircuit uh, model, uh, as opposed to uh, having these slow fluctuations that were visible in the experiment. And to remedy this, we, we gradually increase the synaptic strengths of cortical-cortical uh, -cortical connections to evoke inter-area interactions as parameterized by this variable chi. Um, and it turns out that we have to increase the synaptic strengths onto inhibitory neurons more than onto excitatory ones in order to remain in a low rate asynchronous irregular state. And there's a sweet spot at uh, chi is uh, 1.9, uh, where the activity shows the same mix of um, short and long fluctuations that is present in the experimental data. And uh, um, the network needs to be poised uh, just below the tr uh, transition uh, between, um, between a state with low activity and a state with high activity. And um, that corresponds to a well-known phenomenon of dynamical slowing uh, when, when a dynamical system approaches an instability. Um, the resulting activity looks like uh, this for three um, example areas out of the 32 areas in the model, primary visual cortex, secondary visual cortex, and the frontal eye field. Um, and uh, the spikes of the excitatory neurons are shown in blue and those of the inhibitory neurons in red. And um, yeah, the, the average uh, spike rates of, of the areas they fluctuate on, on short and long time scales. Um, um, we wanted to, uh, uh, to check uh, the correspondence with the experimental data from V1 if we had these parallel uh, spike train recordings. And those recordings contain intervals with uh, less and more synchrony for which the spectra are given by these green and purple curves, but the overall spectrum from the experiment is given by that yellow curve. And from the simulation is this black curve and it, uh, the overall decay matches uh, pretty well. Uh, except for this little uh, bump between 20 and 40 hertz in the, in the simulation. Um, we also looked at the distribution of uh, spike rates across neurons. So uh, computing the average rate of each neuron and then considering the distribution of these uh, average rates. Um, the yellow curve from the experiment is now uh, barely uh, uh, visible because it matches the simulation so well. Um, and uh, the good match occurs only when we are poised exactly below this uh, instability. Um, when the inter-area synapses are taken to be stronger, um, you get the blue curve, or if they're weaker, you get this red curve and it no longer matches the, the experiment. Um, we also looked at the order in which activity propagates across the areas based on um, the correlation functions between pairs of areas. And um, it turns out that uh, parietal areas are activated first, um, followed by uh, temporal and occipital areas, and finally an, uh, a reduction instead of an increase in activity occurs in the, in the frontal regions. And this um, ordering of, um, of, of parietal uh, before ox uh, occipital regions corresponds to the feedback propagation observed in the EEG experiment that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. Um, finally, we looked at the area level functional connectivity and we compared the correlations between the simulated synaptic inputs to each area 
with the functional connectivity between areas from fMRI from macaque. And um, the comparison um, reveals a match that peaks around the same uh, strength of inter-area connections as where the microscopic spiking activity was uh, the most realistic. And um, this uh, match between the simulation and experiment is as good as you can expect based on the variability between the individual monkeys. So this is an indication that we are really uh, capturing some aspects of the resting state activity of the cortex. We have made the entire source code for the multi-area model available on GitHub. Um, and um, yeah, more recently, we, we decided to try to transfer what we learned from a CAC cortex to human cortex. Here, we don't restrict ourselves to vision-related areas, but uh, model an entire um, hemisphere, though initially in the coarse parcellation. And this yields um, a model size uh, similar to the macaque model in terms of number of neurons, but because of the larger number of synapses per neuron in human cortex, we have about twice as many synapses. And um, the neuron densities are at the moment still uh, mainly from von Economo and Koskinas, a very old publication, but they are supplemented with some more precise uh, measurements from the big brain where available. And uh, we also already take uh, laminar thicknesses from, from the big brain. Uh, the area level cortical cortical connectivity is taken from DTI from the human connectome project. Um, laminar connection patterns are not available for the for the human brain so we estimate them based on the macaque data and um, and the human neuron densities. So um, when the target area has a lower uh, neuron density um, than, the, than the source area. We have a feed-forward um, pattern uh, dominated by projections from supergranular layers to layer four. And when the, uh, when the target area has a higher neuron density than the source area, we have a feedback pattern dominated by projections from infragranular layers to outside layer four. And um, on the target side, we again need to map the synapses to the corresponding target neurons whose cell bodies might be in a different layer. For this uh, purpose, we use uh, morphological reconstructions of human neurons um, and simply assuming again that uh, the probability for the synapse to be established on a particular neuron is proportional to the total length of, of the dendrites in the given layer. And um, for, like for the macaque model, um, the connectivity with the local circuits uh, consists of area-specific scaled versions of, of the model of Pochans and Dissima. Um, the resulting connectome, um, again, exhibits a sensible community structure with a singulate um, somatomotor, limbic, uh, sensory processing, and cognitive control clusters. Um, as for the macaque model, uh, we use mean field theory to gain a more systematic understanding of the system. And this analysis uh, reveals that um, stronger um, excitatory synapses onto inhibitory uh, than onto excitatory cells help to maintain a low rate uh, asynchronous irregular state. Um, and uh, supercomputer simulations uh, confirm that the mean field parameters, uh, that the mean field theory uh, identifies parameters that correspond to a reasonable ground state of activity. And this raster plot shows uh, spiking activity of one uh, representative area. And on the right, the functional connectivity between the areas is shown. Um, these are preliminary results and we will continue to, to explore how multi-scale resting state dynamics uh, emerges in human cortex. Um, apart from properties like uh, firing rates, asynchrony, irregularity, and, and functional connectivity, we have started looking at intrinsic time scales as defined by the width of uh, single neuron autocorrelation functions. These time scales uh, increase along the cortical hierarchy and are, are thought to be important for, for information processing by providing different temporal uh, integration windows. And a PhD student in my group, Alexander von Megan, has uh, developed a dynamical uh, mean field theory that allows us to 
uh, to uh, predict uh, intrinsic time scales uh, from balanced networks of, of leaky integrated fire units. Um, it goes uh, beyond traditional mean field theory by considering the, the colored noise problem. Sasha, it's ten, 10 minutes. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, and these uh, results provide a new tool for, for studying the experimentally observed hierarchy of time scales. To summarize, um, we have developed uh, uh, multi scale spiking network models of macaque and human cortices. Uh, the macaque model uh, code is, is freely available, can be found on GitHub. Uh, we've derived uh, population sizes and connectivity based on extensive experimental data complemented with predictive connectomics, that is uh, statistical estimates based on known quantities. And uh, we recently wrote this uh, quite extensive introductory chapter on, on bringing anatomical information into neuronal network models. These, uh, these models are meant as, as platforms for further developments and uh, hopefully for a better understanding uh, cortical function uh, in future. Um, and I owe a great deal to, to all these people and uh, I thank you for your attention and I, I welcome any questions. Great, uh, excellent. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we have a question here from Yi Xia. Uh, Sasha, is the layer specific interaction important for reproducing the inter area interaction? If, if you model each brain area as a one layer structure, what does the inter area interaction look like? Uh, that's a very good question, and we haven't actually uh, systematically investigated this. So, so I, honestly, I can't tell you, and, but I suspect that it would be possible to still get quite reasonable um, inter-area interactions at, yeah, at the area level if you got rid of, of the laminar structure. Yeah. So and then there's... Why, yep. mm, that's why, uh, yeah, in terms of the laminar interactions, we did more uh, uh, specific analysis. On, um, we did a Granger causality analysis to look more specifically at what the laminar interactions are and, uh, and found you know, that they don't uh, uh, reflect the, the anatomical connectivity one-to-one, uh, -one, but uh, they depend on the dynam dynamical state. Okay, very good. And there is one from uh, Daniel Fellemann. Uh, Sasha, very nice. I have a lot to learn. Well, I think that. Uh -oh. was <laughs> <laughs> I am unclear about estimates for inter area -like connectivity and also cell type specific connections, like dendrite percent or layer or what? Do, do you understand oh, the question? Uh, yeah. Right, okay. Um, Hmm. Probably how the, so how when the, we when we plot uh, the the connectivity matrices in the end, we we look at uh, numbers of synapses usually, mm -hmm. or connection probabilities, mm -hmm. right? So, but uh, the anatomical data underlying them, they 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 don't uh, tell you exactly, uh, you know, because when we have uh, fractions of labeled neurons, we have to make some further assumptions like that each sending neuron establishes the same number of synapses in each target area to which it projects, for instance. So mm. we make assumptions like that, yeah. uh, which may be wrong and can be uh, uh, further refined in future. Mm. I have a question about sort of that. I mean, this is so far, I mean, in what you showed, it's, it's mainly been about sort of getting the like AI state right. <laughs> like sort of like having the like close to criticality and this was also a, and this is important i mean this was also a topic in yesterday right this is actually one of the yeah. hallmarks to maybe that your model is doing uh, uh, okay and then also then you go into resting state which is some sense a little bit like of the same thing but but when it comes to your visual area model we know that some of these areas in the macaque actually recognize images right so it's it maybe do you have a thought of ways to try to 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 uh, adapt your model so that you can also address these kinds of more functional uh, yeah functional behavior yeah actually we have a project a collaboration with uh, Wolfgang Maas on uh, studying learning to learn in some uh, subsets of of these areas 
Mm. Uh, we don't know yet exactly to what extent we need to uh, to put in, um, for instance, like to like uh, connectivity, uh, like in the Bile uh, model mm. by hand, and to what extent that will uh, emerge uh, when we um, subject uh, the model to to tasks. Uh, but uh, it will be we'll have to use some combinations of uh, of those two uh, to get them higher. Uh, microscopic uh, specificity of, of the connectivity within the areas and between them. Yeah. And here's a question from Anton. Uh, what are your thoughts about building a full-scale model of monkey cortex from 4 million neurons to 800 million neurons? How feasible is that at the moment? Well, if you uh, use a full uh, supercomputer, you can uh, uh, approximately uh, simulate this entire hemisphere. <laughs> Um, but uh, that's that's not in our in our plans uh, at the moment. So uh, we want to study uh, first um, what is the influence of the distance dependent connectivity within the area. So to expand the lateral extent of some of the areas, then um, yeah, it will be important to to add the lambda cortical interaction. So I think there are a few things that are more important to to look at first. And, uh, and maybe uh, uh, with some technological advances in the simulation technology, then we won't have to burn um, so many megawatts uh, to, to do this entire simulation then in future. Yeah. And then uh, maybe a f yeah, one more question here from uh, Etienne Yu. Uh, hi, Sasha. You said you had a mix between slow and fast activity at rest. How would you describe more precisely the dynamics at rest? Did you try to see if the main mean field model captures the same state? Right. Okay. So there is still a use uh, for for um, for the simulations, which is uh, because the mean field theory cannot uh, capture this synchrony well. So uh, there is no mean field theory that I know of that that captures all that, and that's why we still need to do the simulations as well. Um, so, um, yeah, and uh, I should mention also that this uh, particular uh, mix of slow and fast oscillations uh, was uh, both the uh, uh, experiments that we compared with, they were in lightly anesthetized uh, animals. And, uh, and this, uh, yeah, exact uh, mix would change probably in uh, more alert uh, waking states. Good, and then the final question maybe from uh or a video from Adrian Arias. Uh, Arias. Uh, which spatial distribution are you using to locate the position of the neurons based on the neural density? Uh, wh which spatial distribution of the neurons we use? Yeah, are you using to locate the position of the neurons? I guess it's sort of how do you, based on neural density, how do you, how do you yeah. position the neurons? Uh, in our model, we don't uh, position the, the neurons yet uh, within the areas. They don't have, uh, have an actual uh, spatial location, but we would need that in, in future to, to model uh, other brain signals like the LFP and the EEG. You very much do. <laughs> yes. So, and then, okay, a final question from uh, Nicolas Blauch. Sasha, uh, it seems that spiking network simulations are always done on CPU. Is there any limitation keeping from running these simulations on GPU? Um, well, uh, recently there was a, a, a nice uh, paper by Jamie Knight and Thomas Novotny at the University of Sussex, and they used their simulator called Gen uh, to, to actually port our, our multi-area model uh, to a single uh, GPU. Um, Mm. using procedural connectivity, so they uh, redrawn the connectivity. Uh, uh, as soon as you um, mm, you have plasticity and you have more, you don't just have statistical connectivity, but more specific connectivity, um, that will become harder to do. But uh, yeah, uh, they're also thinking about solutions for that. <laughs>